Today's episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Bartimaeus Rehabilitation Services, Inc., and features a group discussion on the topic of brain injury and justice that was facilitated by Dr. Carolyn Lemsky, a clinical neuropsychologist with over 25 years of experience working with people living with the challenges of a brain injury. Hi, everyone. I'm Carolyn Lemsky. I'm a clinical neuropsychologist and the clinical director at Community Head Injury Resource Services of Toronto. And um, joining me here today are Mary Perrick, Katie Almond, and Dr. Catherine Wiseman Hakes to have a conversation about brain injury in the justice system. And so, what I'm going to do now is to turn it over to folks. Um, to, to provide a brief introduction to themselves before we get started. So Mary, could you um, tell us who you are and what your interest is in this topic? Uh, for sure. So I am the communications manager at the Brain Injury Society of Toronto. Um, and I am here mostly because we have created a website. It's the first and currently the only resource, I believe, for people in Ontario who live with brain injury and other cognitive challenges who are involved in the criminal justice system. Um, and our website is a bit unique in terms of uh, half of it is geared towards people living with brain injury and perhaps their loved ones who are supporting them. And then the other half is geared towards legal professionals. Well, that's great. It's a tremendous resource, and hopefully we'll get a chance to talk a little bit more about um, what's in that resource and how folks can access it. Uh, and um, Katie, can you tell us who you are? Hi, I'm Katie Almond. I'm a probation and parole officer. I work in the Moss Park area. I worked in the justice system for 37 years. I have a complex caseload with a, a large proportion of individuals who I suspect have brain injuries. I don't always actually have a diagnosis on file. Uh, I also chair the Downtown Toronto Local Human Services and Justice Coordinating Committee and its provincial counterpart, and that brings together a number of community partners to try to affect positive change for our clients, particularly those who are presented with physical and cognitive challenges. Thank you. Oh, great. Thanks. And Dr. Wiseman Hanks. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, please call me Catherine. Uh, <laughs> I'm Catherine. Um, I'm a speech language pathologist and my uh, uh, doctoral work is in the area of clinical neuroscience. So I am a, um, an assistant clinical professor in speech language pathology in the School of Rehabilitation Science at McMaster University. And I'm also an affiliate scientist with the Kite Research Institute, uh, University Health Network, Toronto Rehab Institute. Um, I'm also the uh, director of a nonprofit organization called the Compassionate Justice Fund. Uh, and Katie Almond uh, is uh, a very valued and important member of our uh, advisory committee. The aim of that, uh, the Compassionate Justice Fund, is to provide uh, funding to support rehabilitation uh, primarily as well as other uh, needs or services for individuals with brain injury from underserved and marginalized committee, uh, communities, for example, individuals uh, with brain injury in the criminal justice system. So thank you very much for having me here today and very passionate about this topic. It is. It's a very important topic. And I know that supporting folks long term in the community, um, it, it, it is something that unfortunately becomes relevant for a lot of the folks that we serve. And I guess what we should probably do is to get started by saying, you know, um, or talking a little bit about why it's such an important topic, um, why brain injury in the justice system is such an important topic. Um, and I'm wondering if uh, you could tell us a little bit about the research that you've had that, that kind of tells us um, something about the intersection between brain injury and uh, the justice system. Okay, well, I'd, I'd be happy to, uh, to respond to that. So first of all, um, we know that the prevalence of brain injury um, in the criminal justice system internationally is staggeringly high, that uh, research evidence has shown that uh, approximately 80% of adults in the justice system who are incarcerated uh, have uh, a history of brain injury, and the majority of those sustained their injury long before they ever became involved in the justice system. The majority of people had their injury uh, 
around the age of 15. And again, this is, this is not research that I personally conducted, but this is, this is research evidence from around the world. Um, we also know that among the youth justice system that the uh, it's at least a minimum of 50% or greater uh, have um, a history of brain injury. The second thing that I think is also very important is that the majority of these individuals have had more than one injury. Uh, research that I've conducted, uh, we had um, an average among the participants in our study of three and a half injuries uh, and some evidence from the United States that people have shown up to um, 12 injuries. So many of these individuals have been involved uh, in, in violence and have a history of uh, violence and abuse. So they have, many of them have sustained repeat hits to the head, face, um, body uh, attempted strangulation over their lifetime. So many have repeat injuries. So it's a huge issue. Uh, and the other reason that it's so important um, is that uh, brain injury can cause a number of challenges and issues for individuals that may, in, in many cases, can be a contributing factor, uh, if not the contributing factor to them ending up in the justice system in the first place. And really, it should be um, a rehabilitative approach rather than a punitive approach. So some of the changes that happen with brain injury that might include, you know, more difficulty in communicating with other folks, um, greater difficulty in reading social cues and communication can lead to uh, also to changes in self-regulation, um, which often happen if, if, as a result of brain injury. And by that, I mean, you know, the ability to kind of manage emotions and um, kind of work systematically towards goals, those things can be affected. And that might increase the likelihood of someone coming into contact with uh, the justice system. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, we, we often, as you, as you so clearly stated, you know, we see significant challenges with uh, communication, with aspects of cognition, so thinking and memory, difficulty with impulse control, um, as you said, also said emotional lability, difficulty reading social cues, so not understanding, you know, when someone uh, might be really angry or upset, uh, and that can result in violent confrontations. Um, we can also see increased um, aggress aggression uh, and, and violent behavior, um, as well as um, other challenges um, with, uh, you know, being exploited and, and being abused, not really understanding when someone is uh, trying to uh, coerce them into doing something that likely they should not be doing. So there's many factors. Uh, and in fact, I think that's a really good point. I think um, uh, I've been involved with a number of cases where some of my clients weren't really able to kind of accurately discern what the motives of somebody might be, and they got taken advantage of. You know, some of the scams where they say, you know, you can go and cash a check because a relative died and they truly believe that they were doing a good thing and then perhaps were arrested for fraud um, in one case or um, believing um, in, in another case that um, a woman might have been interested in their attention and then um, coming to the attention of the law because they were misreading those social cues and were arrested for sexual harassment. And so that's something that we do see. Um, and it's a misunderstanding in many cases. And in some cases, um, you know, even if um, um, there was a criminal act that did occur, there was uh, some contribution of the brain injury. Then. So it's really an important issue. It's really an important issue. Um, so I'm wondering what, um, what we're seeing as sort of the biggest barriers in terms uh, or uh, problems presented for folks um, when they come in contact with the justice system. And I'm, um, I'm interested to hear from, um, from anybody who might have um, a perspective on that. I'm happy to, to share, but I'm, I'm wondering, Katie, if you'd like to go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I'll just, uh, if I could just jump in here. Um, sure. Where do I start? So I would say one of the difficulties is that the justice system is such an abstract place. It's it's uh, when it's in a, when it's running when it's there's not a pandemic. It's it's loud. It's chaotic. It's hard for people who don't have a brain injury to understand what's going on. 
Uh, it really is sort of an echo chamber. And in the midst of that echo chamber, and now that echo chamber exists mainly on Zoom, although that will transition, I suppose, in the next few months, uh, clients are provided with instructions or directions to follow, and they often just agree to them. They don't really understand what's going on. And when I say abstract, and I'll give you a quick example, uh, a client will be told uh, there'll be a condition on a probation order that says, you are not to be in an area bound by, you know, Dundas Street to the north, Queen to the south, you know, uh, Victoria Park. To, so they, they, they have these, or Victoria Street to the uh, east. They're given these sort of, sort of uh, difficult parameters to even grasp. And what they, uh, so they come in to see me and it turns out, of course, they've breached the order because they've gone into that sort of zone. And what I say to them is, that's where the Eaton Center is. You're not allowed to go to the Eaton Center. So if, in wording conditions, it's really important that judges provide clear conditions for a client that they can understand, and that I, as the supervising probation officer, explain those conditions, particularly if they're written in a very dense or complex way. I often, you know, before Google, I would just draw a map and I'd say, you can't, I'd highlight it, you can't go here. Now I can just print one off and I can highlight it and say, you can't go here. Uh, and really so try to make that as concrete as possible. And I'll say, you know, there's McDonald's on the corner. You get, no, I know where that is, that kind of thing. And I'll write down McDonald's. So things that are familiar to them that they may recall, I try to work with them. And I always ask them to repeat back what I've told them. So I have some sense that they understand it because typically they in court, they just said yes to everything. And they really didn't understand the conditions being imposed. And then they're at great risk to breach those conditions, not because they're, criminals, but because they really don't understand what the parameters are. So I do a lot of, I do and my other problem, you know, as a probation officer, I talk really fast and I, uh, as a person, and I tend to, and this is something I really had to work on. I will ask three questions in one sentence, you know, so you were saying, this, and then you talk to the counselor and then you were going to go over to the harm reduction clinic and the client just stares at me. So uh, I, I've learned to ask the questions in bite-sized chunks, wait for the response, uh, you know, reinforce the response, clarify it, move on. It's a longer conversation. And sometimes in the anxiety, sort of this anxiety, of like I've got to get all this, get this information from the client. They haven't come in lately. I really have to slow it down so that I get the information, so I get clear information so that I'm not um, putting them at risk as well. That would be You've come to understand, yeah, if somebody gets arrested, and then after that arrest, I mean, whatever upsetting event that there was, there's a barrage of information that happens. And, you know, anybody who's upset um, or anxious in the context of an arrest might have difficulty kind of parsing all of that and figuring it all out. But when you have a brain injury, it's a particular challenge. And what you've noticed is, is that very often, even people who are really wanting to comply with orders may get them in a format that they can't understand. And the whole process really is just kind of, it moves very quickly. Some of the instructions are very abstract. Um, and I know from my own, my own attempts to kind of get information from the court, it's a hard system to figure out. Yeah, exactly. So a big barrier is understanding court processes. And yeah, and I think I think that's why visual maps are often so useful, you know, sort of a journey map through the system as opposed to explaining a lot of different concepts. I mean, you know, it's meaningless if the person doesn't know where they are situated in that system and where they could end up. I mean, the very concrete thing, if you do this, you, you could end up in jail, right? So I've used, I've used a, a, a journey map as well, a visual that we have that we prepared with the, at the HSJCC, which, and I can locate the client on the map and say, this is where you are now. And if you, if you don't abide by, if you don't, obey this, you could end up here. So when you talk about this map, and this is something that um, I think might be included in some of the materials on the website, can you describe to us what the map is and how it helps? Well, I'm talking about the map that we use at the HSJCC that we created out of consultations, but there may be, um, Mary might have uh, information about one that they use as well as sort of a navigation tool. So I'll just actually turn it over to you. Um, Thank you. Actually, uh, on abijustice.org, uh, what I was going to say is I think there would be fewer barriers if like every person who dealt with people in the criminal justice system just, you know, followed what you do, Katie. And that's 
basically so much of what we have on their website for people who are not familiar with brain injury. You know, you don't ask, do you some tell, ask somebody, do you understand? You say, tell me what you understood, right? And especially when you think of, as we've said, how stressful this process is, even if you don't have a brain injury, which I think you said, Carolyn, like it, it's just so complex to try and understand. Um, so, so yeah, so what, what I was just going to add is at abijustice.org on the professional side, we have tips on uh, things that perhaps you, even if with good intentions, you wouldn't think of that somebody with a brain injury is dealing with such as you said, don't ask three questions in one sentence. As I'm sitting here, we're in a temporary office at BIST right now. And one of our uh, tools is uh, how to hold meetings that are accessible. Um, and part of that is, is your office noisy? We do, sadly, we live, we're in Toronto. So as uh, I'm here, like we hear the street, street car screeching, right? Like how do you reduce those um, sounds and conditions like lighting as well that can really impact someone who's dealing with brain injury, who might be light sensitive, who might have hearing sensitivity and um, like sensitivity to noises rather, and, and just to make sure um, they're comfortable. And as you said, like the clear language of it's not don't go past Victoria Street, it's don't go to the Eaton Center, right? This is all stuff that like for us, I saw you, Carolyn, trying to figure out what those boundaries meant. And it's like, oh, just don't go to the Eaton Center, right? That's, it's simple. So that makes it better. Mm -hmm. So, so communicating in clear and concrete ways, and for professionals, it sounds like going to justice.org, abijustice.org. Can you give us yeah, the abijustice.org? Yeah. Uh, yeah, ABI yeah. yeah, it's probably worth repeating. Uh, going to that website and and um, getting familiarized with some of the potential consequences of a brain injury, things like sensory overload and difficulty with distractions and um, communication tips and tricks. So that I'm guessing lawyers and other court personnel will have a, an easier time kind of communicating with folks and, and making sure that they get the messages that they need. Mm -hmm. um, is, is there anything that you can, if, if a person is themselves is to find themselves in um, a situation where they have to um, come to the court, do you have any uh, suggestions for them about how to prepare for that kind of event and, and what might be helpful? Um, for us on our site, um, part of our resources include either printable or um, I guess like downloadable uh, resources like uh, such as uh, simple checklists. Um, again, like things we've had because we also do provide um, case coordination for, for people living with brain injury at BIST. And something our uh, coordinators have encountered is um, clients who have not shown up for court because their executive function is impaired and the problem solving of how do I take public transportation to court to show up, just, just that, like, and all the steps that are involved with uh, leaving on time, having money saved for public transit, uh, how to get there, all, all of that can be something that is not possible for some people, with for many people with brain injury, right? So, um, so yeah, it's like whether it's for the, the person with the brain injury or it's someone in their life who's supporting them, we do have those like here, you're going to court. This is what you need to do before you go to court. And this is a checklist. And part of that checklist is how are you getting there? Do you have money for parking? Do you have money for public transit? Do you know when to leave? So that it, it's just, it's laid off. It's laid out for them rather uh, to have the cognitive prompts to, to, uh, to hopefully be more successful. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just the, just the mechanics, uh, never mind understanding the justice system itself, but getting across town at a particular time and place might be difficult remembering when that date is and, and getting there. And so there's some guidance, um, some concrete guidance about how to help folks kind of negotiate those really mechanical, important things um, to ensure that they don't wind up with charges upon charges for noncompliance. Um, which is something, unfortunately, that, that we, have, um, we have seen. Bartimaeus Rehab Services Incorporated has been setting the standard of excellence in rehabilitation support workers since 1988, providing direct therapy, transitional support, 
and community integration to children, youth, adults, and seniors recovering from an acquired brain injury or serious trauma. Don't just take our word for it. Here's what one of our clients said after working with us. They were reliable, empathetic, caring, and always professional. Truly a great resource for the community. You can learn more by visiting www.bartimaeusrehab.com. Is there, um, is, is there anything else that anybody else had, um, have, has to add about things that might be useful for folks to know about um, supporting people in uh, the criminal justice system if they're living with some kind of neurocognitive impairment? Okay. Um, I would, I would just like to add something. Um, and every, you know, the, everything that everyone has raised so far is, is so extremely important. Um, the first thing that I would just want to say is that, uh, you know, once they do get into the court system, um, you know, there are laws that uh, in both Ontario and in Canada, in Ontario, we have the Ontarians with Disabilities Act uh, and the Accessible Canada Act, and communication is a uh, of cron is a recognized disability. Uh, and so there's a couple of things. First of all, we recommend that the accessibility coordinator at every courthouse uh, be notified when there is um, a client with, uh, with a brain injury. Secondly, um, there is an or uh, communication intermediaries uh, which is CI Canada, and those are speech language pathologists who have um, specific training on supporting individuals in court. Uh, so they should uh, also um, be brought in to support the individual. Secondly, um, I think one of the really important issues, you know, we're talking a lot about what we can do to support the individual with the brain injury. Uh, but part of the reason we're here today is that there's such a need for education and training of people in the justice system um, about the prevalence of brain injury, what it looks like to have a brain injury, because we know that brain injury is most often a hidden disability. Um, and so oftentimes people with brain injuries um, are either the, the disability is minimized, uh, which is absolutely incorrect because we, we do know that brain injury um, meets the criteria of the uh, World Health Organization as a chronic lifelong uh, disease that can change uh, over, over time. And in fact, um, issues can come up years down the road uh, from the injury that are related to, to the initial injury. Uh, so it's recognizing that it really is a disability, regardless of whether or not it's visible or not. Uh, secondly, uh, as I mentioned, providing training across all levels of the justice system, uh, first responders, police officers, court staff, legal staff, uh, justice of the peace, judges, uh, crown attorneys, all of them, uh, and then correction staff, bail staff across literally the whole trajectory of the justice system need to have training in screening for uh, and understanding brain injury and what they legally need to do to support someone who has a disability um, under under those uh, under those acts. So the the other thing that I just wanted to add, uh, if we can back up a little bit, Carolyn, I think the first question you asked us was about barriers. So I would also like to suggest that screening for brain injury should be absolutely mandatory in the justice system. Uh, and in fact, um, it is this is in place in other jurisdictions across the world, and certainly um, the UK, Australia, and New Zealand are leaders in, in the field. Um, I can also share that in the UK, uh, anyone who comes into the justice system uh, is actually provided with a communication and language screening by a registered speech language therapist, speech language pathologist. Wow. Yeah, so that's that takes yeah. place in in uh, in the UK, uh, and there are speech language therapists with all of the offending teams. I, I don't like that word offending. I mean, people have committed an <laughs> offense. It doesn't mean they are offenders per se. Um, and also with the youth offending teams, each one has a dedicated speech language therapist 
who, as I say, does a communication screening. Uh, and then the findings from that are uh, summarized and provided to um, all of the uh, people, whether it's the lawyer, the judge, et cetera, uh, bail um, that are involved in that young person or the adult's case. Uh, and then the individual is also offered an opportunity to do um, some therapy. So I think that that's absolutely critical and something that I would like to see implemented um, both in Ontario in, and, uh, and in Canada. So I would, again, go ahead. So I just would say reiterate that, you know, one of the biggest barriers is just really lack of awareness and we need to implement routine screening. Yeah. And, and you make a fantastic point um, that if justice is going to be served for anybody, that an individual really needs to be able to understand the process, what's occurring. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and, and and as you say, it's an invisible disability. So screening is an important thing, and it's 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 amazing to know um, two things that you said that I'd like to highlight. One is that there are models in the world that we could be replicating that we know are successful in identifying some of these barriers and, and rectifying them, and likely reducing cost to society by reducing the likelihood of reoffending, um, and um, certainly getting better outcomes for everyone involved. So um, I think that that's prime importance. The other thing that you said, I think that really bears repetition is that each courthouse does have an accessibility coordinator. And so, um, and, and I guess for anybody listening, you would want to know that you can ask for that person's support, right? Um, without, if you don't have another um, say advocate with you um, or helping you, knowing that there is an accessibility coordinator could be a very important, and for families to know that um, could be a very important piece of information. So thank you uh, for emphasizing that that is a legal right that folks have and that there's some accommodation for it. Um, that's, that's fantastic. Um, I guess um, what I'm really, I'm interested in because you um, mentioned um, the uh, Health and Justice Committee, uh, the HSJCC, I'm probably not getting that acronym entirely correct. Um, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit, um, uh, Katie and Catherine, about um, the work of that committee and uh, what we should know, if, if there's anything that we should know about that and how we can support that kind of community effort um, to increase um, awareness and justice in, in, uh, in the system. So the, the Human Services and Justice Coordinating Committee, which I know is a mouthful, uh, was start, they was first started and they were in about 1997. And uh, we now have 30, we have 14 regions in the province with HSJCCs, the province is broken down to 14 regions and 38 local committees. Um, so the local committees are sort of grassroots, on the ground, problem solving. Many brain injury organizations belong to those committees. And the what we do is we try to solve problems sort of in the moment or in the month or <laughs> sometimes it takes longer. And then what we do when there are issues that consistently come up in our provincial in scope, what we do is we we sort of push them up the food chain, for lack of a better word, to provincial committee. And originally there was not a provincial committee, but there were so many issues that were uh, consistently raised that we thought we have to do something about this. And what we do has to be congruent with the, with the policy direction of the province, because we receive a small amount of funding from, funding from the Ministry of Health. And so we, we struck a provincial committee and we have a provincial secretariat with its staff. And that secretariat's job uh, is to help us with the policy, coordinate our network, reach out to our network. We have regular meetings, webinar series. We have a great website. Just type in HSJCC. And we have wonderful people like Catherine sitting at the committee. Uh, we also have Dr. Flora Matheson who works in the area of, uh, of brain injury. So that's great. They've been great voices at the committee because it uh, demystifies um, well, also sort of a combination of things, the academic world and academic work that's been done on brain injury. And then, and then also looks at what the on the ground work is being done. And until they joined the committees, I'm not sure that was happening. Um, this is just as, if I could just quickly speak to what you were talking about earlier, uh, Catherine, about the need for education and training. There's a general acknowledgement that we should be providing education and training on brain injury. 
and on developmental disabilities, uh, but that's not happening yet. And uh, because this hasn't happened yet, and it probably, hopefully will happen sooner rather than later, over the years, I've just developed my only own ways of asking questions to try to suss out if a client is struggling with a brain injury, because anecdotally, it went from being anecdotal to being, this isn't anecdotal anymore. I see a lot of people reporting a history of brain injuries as children or and or as adults because they have such risky lives. So they really are, um, they really are vulnerable. So the HSJCC strives to uh, highlight those issues and try to solve them as much as possible at the local level and then raise things up to the provincial level. Catherine, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, I, I think the other point that I would want to add is that, you know, having the HSJCC, which theoretically <laughs> is sort of our pipeline to the Ministry of the Solicitor General, the Ministry, the Community uh, and Children, and I always forget the exact name, um, but, you know, we really need to inform policy uh, at, at a provincial level and at, at a, uh, a federal level as well. Um, you know, for example, uh, there are mental health courts. You know, in my view, I think it would be extremely valuable to have a brain injury court for anyone with, with cognitive disabilities. And oftentimes they get shuffled over, if I understand correctly, Katie, to the mental health court. Um, and sometimes a lot of the behaviors that are actually a result of the brain injury per se are misattributed to being specifically or just due to mental health challenges. So we know that, you know, the two uh, are often occur together. Um, you know, all of these individuals have experienced trauma, emotional trauma, abuse, um, and of course, there are mental health considerations, uh, but a lot of the times it really is uh, an issue around the brain injury. For example, you know, the emotional lability, the not picking up on social cues, um, sometimes the inappropriate social responses, uh, perhaps laughing when they should be showing remorse in, in the court system um, or, you know, saying something that that's really inappropriate. Uh, and that really is a, a result of the brain injury. Um, so again, I, I think that having the HSJCC where we have access to uh, people in the justice system, you know, from police officers to correction officers to on the ground uh, workers to judges, legal professionals, um, probation and parole, uh, mental health uh, workers, et cetera. I think that really affords a, a very unique opportunity um, to, uh, to really provide uh, education across a number of fields, as well as, as I said earlier, to provide, in theory, a pipeline of information um, at the ministry level, because really that's where change does need to be affected. Yeah, actually, you, I was just going to say the provincial table has, I, I, I say the people who write the checks, it's the directors and the higher level folks at the ministries that are the human services and justice ministries and Correctional Service Canada and a number of other organizations that are provincial in scope. So the whole idea of the provincial meetings is to get their ear about what we're talking about at the local committees. Sorry, Carolyn. No, I, I was just going to say, so So now I'm getting the picture that that committee really does connect the dots. It connects the dots between the academic work and what we understand about um, the um, occurrence of brain injury and how it impacts an individual in their life and as a result of the justice system, but then also to, 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 to connect those kind of what can be really kind of siloed um, mm -hmm. administrative structures, getting everyone talking um, and doing some of that advocacy work, hopefully bringing about some of the changes that that um, uh, Catherine was talking about in, in the UK, where we're really much more aware of and compensating better um, for these things. You know, it's... Uh, the other piece to this too, um, in addition to connecting the dots, is actually when a person is incarcerated and if they have a brain injury, my impression is from, from the clients that I've served that they seem to be at a significant risk for having a bad time um, while they are incarcerated, um, having difficulty with following rules, sometimes winding up with extensions of their um, sentences as a result of that, and sometimes re injury as a result of assault. Um, and so, you know. 
throughout, it sounds like the correction system, it, there really needs to be some um, advocacy regarding recognizing this invisible disability. And, um, uh, and, and helping folks to compensate, um, providing administrative structures that are gonna reduce the negative impacts of that. I, if I could just jump in here and say, right now I'm actually working on a project uh, with our community reintegration unit. Uh, so we are, we've just launched uh, a community re reintegration strategy. So it's to provide a warm handoff for clients with complex needs from the institutions to the community. And uh, it's, uh, we are, it's staffed by wonderful people working very hard to try to effect change and have that linkage between the institution and the community and to ensure that those community organizations are aware of the individual and can provide them with help starting when they're inside. So this is a fairly recent development and it's moving pretty fast and it's getting, uh, you know, sort of early days, but I'm sure that we'll get some good results. So that is that that's come about for large part because of, of work that people have done behind the scenes about how vulnerable our clients are. So recognizing that folks are vulnerable while they're inside and then helping them to make the transition to get out. I know that I've talked to folks from the John Howard and sometimes it's, it's hard even to, to just get um, a person across the parking lot, literally um, to the trailer at the John Howard to, um, to get some basic supports. Um, and so that's a, I think, um, what you've laid out today is that from the very beginning, from the arrest um, to any processing through the judicial system, and, it, and if there is incarceration through that release process, that at every step along the way, we really have to be aware of this invisible disability and providing the kinds of accommodation uh, that's necessary to help a person understand what's happened, to get the support that they need to address whatever issues are existing and whatever therapy, and to um, make a successful community reentry when that's possible. Um, I'm, I'm thinking that we're, we're getting close to the end of our time, and, I, and, and you guys have um, mentioned some really important resources that I think we should probably make sure that we uh, repeat those cool websites so that people know where to go to get all of that good follow-up information. So um, I guess, Mary, um, it's kind of an omnibus website. Can you can you uh, give us the coordinates to get back in touch with uh, ABI Justice? Yep, www.abijustice.org. Uh, and yeah, lots of great resources for people living with brain injury and also professionals who serve them. Um, so check it out. <laughs> so fantastic. Are there any other uh, particular uh, websites that we should be repeating as we end here? Uh, well, I would like to uh, once again just share the Compassionate Justice Fund. So it is all one word, compassionatejusticefund.org. Um, or is it compassionatejustice.org? I think it's Compassionate Justice Fund. Let me just quickly check. And I will tell you exactly. It's compassionatejusticefund.org. And uh, as I mentioned, you know, we are currently accepting applications. We actually have a number of, of people who we're supporting who are currently incarcerated. Um, so we, we welcome applications from across the province. For people who are in need of support. Sorry. Yes. So I'm just going to say the HSJCC, it's just HSJCC. You don't even need to type in the rest of it. It'll come up. Great website, lots of good resources available. There's a fair amount there about brain injury. And we have we post information about a number of webinars, places to go for training and education, uh, papers that have been written. It's it's a, it's a, We're very lucky. We have a man named Trevor Chim, Tim, Timchuk, who's our communications and knowledge exchange coordinator who sits on our committee. And it, it's his baby. And he's done a great job of... Uh, shepherding us through changes in the website. It's an excellent resource with a lot of good uh, information. Oh, that's so that's so nice to hear. I mean, it, it it really is a great source of optimism to know that this is a recognized issue and that there's so many amazing efforts being put uh, to addressing it. So thank you so much for everyone for joining us and putting out all those great resources and, and helping us to better understand uh, brain injury and the justice system.